Now, before we proceed to our message today, I'd like all of us to have a quick review of what we've been discussing about the book of 1 Corinthians. If you have been following us, you will know that the book of 1 Corinthians is addressed to the most problematic New Testament churches. Probably the most problematic church. In short, we are not exempted. The, the first church founded by the Apostle Paul was problematic. All of these were founded by apostolic churches. I mean, they, they are called apostolic churches, but they had problems. Problem number one, divisions, fighting. Do you notice Christians love to fight each other? Think about it. Where else can you find a group of people who will fight each other in social media, and yet we all claim to be followers of Jesus, we all claim to love Jesus, and yet we fight each other. Somebody once said, Christians are the only soldiers in the world that will shoot each other. It's sad. And that's why next year our theme is love. It's my conviction that many Christians may think they are Christians, but by their behavior, they deny Jesus. If you don't show love, according to Jesus, you don't know him. So think about it. Number two problem, immorality. Next problem, marriages. It's really epidemic. Divorce, separation, it's all over. Problems with gray areas, food, idols, worship. If the Bible is not so clear, how do we address the issue? Do we fight each other? In essentials, remember, in essentials, unity. In non-essentials, what did I say? According to this great man of God, in essentials, unity. In non-essentials, liberty. And in everything else, charity. Problems with the spiritual gifts. Praise God. God is trying to unify churches all over the world now. Either charismatic, Baptist, Methodist, all kinds. They're learning how to work together. This is very crucial when it comes to spiritual gifts. Last week, I praised God for Pastor Marty. He talks about the importance of using spiritual gifts for building each other, not to impress each other. Problems concerning the resurrection. Now, this is what we're going to talk about today. Why? Because the foundation of Christianity rises or falls on this simple truth. Did Jesus rise again from the dead? What if somebody asks you, why do you believe what you believe? Let me repeat. If somebody asks you, what do you believe? Number two, why do you believe what you believe? What are you going to say? Don't copy my friend when he was asked, what do you believe? My friend said, I believe what my church believes. And what, and what does your church believe? My church believes in what I believe. Wow, that's pretty deep. But I suggest you ask yourself, why do you believe what you believe? If you are not able to answer that, I'm afraid that your Christianity will buckle under pressure. A lot of young people today don't go back to churches after college. 70%, this is statistics in the States. In the Philippines, I don't have all the data yet. But one thing I know, young people don't go back to churches. Why? Well, number one, they think of the word hypocrisy. They think we're a bunch of hypocrites. They look at their family. Their family claims to be Christians. They go to church, but they fight. There is no real example at home. But more than that, if you ask me, the reason why they leave church is because they have never gone through the process of asking themselves, why will I follow Jesus? So today, we're going to answer that most foundational question. What is the basics, the most important truth about Christianity? My outline is very simple. Everybody, know, believe, live the gospel. Say that with me. No. Believe, live the gospel. So, that you will never forget, 
copy me. Put your forefinger up like this. All right, everybody? Watching me? I'm watching you. All right. Now, no. Point at your head. No. You got to know the gospel. No. Okay. Point. Don't stop pointing at your head. And then after knowing, what must you do? You got to believe. Go to the heart. How many inches the head from the heart? How many? Somebody once said 12 inches between heaven and hell. Well, my neck is pretty long, so it's 14 inches. No, believe. And then do, live it. Okay, live it. You got to live it. No, believe and live it. Yes, I'm, hi, brother, you are good. You are pointing your, uh, with your legs up, but I cannot really reach it very high. All right. Everybody, one more time. No. Believe. Live it. Okay. Let's start with knowing. You know, the Bible tells us knowledge is important. Hosea chapter 4. Everybody read this together. My people are destroyed for lack of knowledge. Because you have rejected knowledge, I will also reject you from being my priest. Now, gee, God is talking to the priest. But the whole principle is this. My people are destroyed for lack of knowledge. Do you now understand why Satan does not want people to be able to discuss issues without counseling people? Today, young people, even mature people, have lost the art of discussion, the art of debate. You know why? We just don't know how to disagree. We don't know how to discuss. Have you heard of this statement? I have made up my mind. Don't convince me. Have you heard of that? I have made up my mind. Don't give me the facts. How can that be? You know why? We have not learned how to think. So you got to know the truth. Truth is important. You got to know. Our friend, that was during the COVID, right before the COVID, we were together. And she was complaining of stomach ache for the longest time. And her doctor said, just acid reflux. Just take some acid reflux and you'll be okay. So she has been dealing with her stomach ache, thinking, knowing, or believing it is acid reflux. Without knowing, it was cancer. When she discovered she had cancer, it was too late because the cancer has spread all over the stomach. You see, ignorance is not bliss. Knowledge, you got to know. If you don't know, it will cost you a lot. It will impact your future. So the Bible tells us the Apostle Paul wanted the churches the church at Corinth to understand. Let's read 1 Corinthians chapter 15 together, verse 1. Now I make known to you, brethren, the gospel which I preach to you, which you also receive, in which you stand, by which you are saved, if you hold fast the word which I preach to you, unless you believe in vain. Let's begin. Now I make known. That word known is from the Greek word ginosko. The idea is I want you to know intimately. Not just in the head. I like you to know and believe this in the heart. No. Number two, he's talking to believers. I want to make you know, brethren, the gospel. Do you notice the article? The gospel. Many people have no idea what is the gospel. The gospel means good news. But what is the good news? And then before I tell you the good news, he says, this is the gospel which I preach to you. And this gospel is what I, that you receive in which I also stand. In other, in which also you stand. This gospel is so crucial, the Bible says you are saved. In other words, if you believe the gospel, it affects your 
eternal destiny. You are saved. In other words, it is possible for people to be in church and not know the gospel and they are not saved. According to this verse, I'm reminded only two kinds of people. Saved, not saved. I am not being a bigot. I'm not being judgmental, but that's what the Bible says. Saved or not saved. Not only that, notice the next verse. If you hold fast the word which I preach to you. This is grammatically in the present tense. Gospel. If you are truly a follower of Jesus, you will believe it and you will continue to cling on to the gospel. Huh. What is the main point of all of this? Well, let me explain to you the word gospel. The word gospel is from the Greek word euangelion. That's where you have the word eulogy. You means good, galleon, you announce. So the gospel is simply called, everybody, good news. What is so good about the news? Be patient, I'm gonna tell you soon. Next, the word preach is closely related to the word gospel. It is the verb form of the gospel. You, good, agelizo, you announce, you pronounce. So Paul is saying, I preach to you the good news. Why is that important? My friend, the gospel is not opinion. The gospel is not just a good idea. It is an announcement. It is a declaration. It is a historical event. These are facts. The Bible tells us the gospel is good news. It is a fact. It is something that is true. So, what is the gospel? Let's continue reading. 15 verse 3, together. I delivered to you as of first importance. He's now telling you what is the gospel. One thing you learn about the gospel, it is of first importance, protos. It is the most important. You want to know the Bible? You want to know the gospel? This is it. 1 Corinthians 15, he now tells you what is the gospel of primary importance, which I also received. Why is that important? Because Paul is saying, I did not invent the gospel. The gospel is something given. The apostle Paul tells us in Galatians chapter one and two, God, Jesus, directly gave him the gospel. It was so amazing that it changed the life of Paul. It was so unbelievable, Paul had eventually, he had to visit the apostles to compare the notes. And he agreed, they all agreed, that is the gospel. What is the gospel? Well, here is the gospel. Number one, everybody, Christ died for our sins. So what is the gospel, everybody? Christ died for our sins. Now, why is that important? Because many people die. They die for various reasons. Our national hero, Jose Rizal, why did he die? Answer. You have forgotten history? Where was he shot? Luneta. By whom? By the Spaniards. But the Spaniards are our friends, okay? Spaniards are our friends. But I'm saying, historically speaking, he got shot. Why? For political reason. What about Julius Caesar? How did he die? He was... Are you, do you, are you guys studying history? When he was being stabbed, he talked to Brutus, he too. In other words, they all died for reasons, but Jesus Christ is the only person who died in your place, in my place for our sins. That's what the Bible is saying. So what is the good news? Jesus died in my place for my sins. 
according to, everybody read, according to the scriptures. Why is that important? He was buried. Why is that important? He was raised on the third day according to the scriptures. Why is that phrase repeated according to the scriptures, according to the scripture? Can I tell you something? Because God wants you to know he loves you. The day we fell into sin, God wants you to know he's thinking of you, he's thinking of me. You see, the gospel is not something invented by men or angels. God thought of this long time ago. It was not an afterthought. The gospel is God's message to you and to me that he loves you, but that you have a problem. What do we mean according to scriptures? Notice, according to scriptures. In other words, the coming of Jesus was prophesied in the Old Testament. Buried, prophesied, resurrection, prophesied. Let me share with you an example. As early as the book of Genesis chapter 12, the Bible tells us, Genesis 12, I will bless those who bless you, referring to Abraham. The one who curses you, I will curse. In you, all the families of the earth will be blessed. How in the world can all the families be blessed because of Abraham? Genesis chapter 22, 18 tells us, everybody read, in you, in your seed, in your offspring, Abraham, in your offspring, all the nations of the earth shall be blessed. Who is the offspring of Abraham that is blessing the whole world today? Answer, Jesus. Born of a Jewish family. Born of David. Born of Abraham, Isaac, Jacob. And then the Bible tells us, so that you will understand prophecy, one of the most amazing books ever discovered during the discovery of the Qumran cave. How many of you have heard of Qumran cave? Raise your hand. Okay. Let me tell you. The Qumran cave is in the southern part of Judea. It is so dry that the parchments, the documents are well preserved. It is right near the Dead Sea. It is called the Dead Sea Scroll. When that was discovered in the Qumran cave, the Dead Sea Scroll, they have an amazing collection of the books of the Bible. Almost the entire Old Testament are covered in the Dead Sea Scroll. But what amazes me is the book of Isaiah. Because the book of Isaiah, if you go with me to Holy Land, but I do not know whether we can go next year or not, but the Dead Sea Scroll contains the entire book of Isaiah intact. Now, why is that significant? Now, there are many books there. You have Daniel, you have uh, Genesis, Exodus, but I like Isaiah because it is the most prophetic. And I will show you an example of the most prophetic book of the Old Testament that is preserved intact. Isaiah chapter 53. Let's read that together. Example verses, sample verses about the prophecy of the coming of Jesus. Everybody read with me, please. He was pierced through for our transgressions. He was crushed for our iniquities. The chastening of our well-being fell upon him. By his scourging, you are healed. Crucifixion was not yet invented. Crucifixion was invented by the Persian, perfected by the Romans. But when this Isaiah was written, this book, 700 BC, before the coming of Christ, look at what it says. He was pierced for our 
transgressions. The word transgressions means what? You have purposely go against the law. Parabasis. You go against. The next word for sin, he was crushed for our iniquities. That word iniquities deals with perversion. All kinds of sinful perversion. What the Bible is saying is this. Jesus died on the cross. He died for your sin and my sin as prophesied. The chastening of our well-being fell upon him. By his scourging, we are healed. What can be clearer than what the Bible is saying? Let's look at one more verse. Isaiah 53, verse 6. Everybody read this. All of us, like sheep, have gone astray. Each one of us has turned to his own way. That is the very definition of sin. The very definition of sin is your will against God's will. Your way against God's way. You look at children. By the time they are one year old, two years old, three years old. By the way, I'm an expert in children. You know why? I have 22 grandchildren. And I've seen each one of them. I know their parents. Their parents do not teach their children to be bad. Their parents do not teach their children how to disobey. But when they reach a certain age, two, three, in fact, even one years old, their self-will is there, my way. So they will throw a tantrum if, don't, if they don't get it their way. Everybody, this is what the Bible says. Please read. Each of us, like sheep, have gone astray. Each of us have turned to his own way. The Lord, notice, capital L-O-R-D, Yahweh, the very name of God, the Lord, has caused the iniquity of us all to fall on capital H, I am. Who is this him? Jesus, the Son of God. One more verse in Isaiah. Even how he would die and how he would be buried was prophesied. His grave was assigned with wicked men, yet he was with a rich man in his death because he had done no violence, nor was there any deceit in his mouth. Let me ask you a question. Who buried Jesus? Which rich man buried Jesus? Joseph of Arimathea. The Bible described him as rich. He was prophesied in the Bible that he would be the one to do with the burial of Jesus. The Lord was pleased to crush him, putting him to grief. If he would render himself as a guilt offering, he will see his offspring. He will prolong his days. Talking about how Jesus, even though after his death, he will still see future descendants. It has to do with the resurrection. So if you look at Psalm 20, let's look at Romans. Okay, Romans chapter 1. <clears throat> the importance of resurrection. Everybody, please read with me. Together, ready, go. According to the flesh, according to the flesh, Jesus is the son of Grand, 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 grandchildren of grand, grandchild of David. But then, everybody read, who was declared the Son of God with power by the resurrection from the dead according to the spirit of holiness, Jesus Christ our Lord. The foundation of the entire Christianity, your faith, rests on Jesus died and rose again. Why is the resurrection so important? The resurrection is so important because the resurrection proves to us Jesus is the Son of God. The resurrection proves to us Jesus is more than just a man. He is not in the same league as Confucius, as Buddha, as Mohammed, or any great man. He is more than a man. He died and rose again to prove beyond doubt he is the Son of God. Therefore, I like what Tim Keller said. Everybody read this together. If Jesus rose from the dead, then you have to accept 
all that he said. The issue is not whether you like what he said or not. It is not whether you agree or disagree with what he said, but whether he rose again from the dead. The reason why I believe, and you need to know why you believe. Why do you believe in Jesus? Answer. He died, buried, and rose again from the dead. If Jesus did not rise again from the dead, ladies and gentlemen, forget Christianity. You are wasting your time, and I'm wasting my time, and I'm wasting your time. Just follow any other religion you want. But if Jesus died and rose again from the dead, then he becomes the most important person that you need to recognize. And you need to decide for yourself, what shall I do with Jesus? For me, I have decided to follow Jesus because he died and rose again. What about you? Have you decided to follow Jesus? To trust him? So, what is the gospel? Everybody, you must know what? Know that Jesus died for our sins, buried, and rose again. No. Next, what must you do with the gospel? Believe. What do we mean by believe? Let's find out. To believe means what? Well, you, do you know why you believe? Do you know why you believe Jesus rose again? Have you thought about it? Think about it. You know, many people today don't bother to find out why they believe that Jesus died and rose again. Well, we have a member from CCF who really spent his life, grew up, as a believer, decided not to believe. He had questions, and then he decided to study again, and he decided to become a believer. I want to warn all of you right now, you will have children today who are at your home, and they'll begin to question their faith. My advice, do not be angry. My advice, do not shut them down. When people ask you, and they tell you their doubts, you must be patient. You must listen. Why are you doubting? Do not ever shut people off because they doubt their faith. Learn to listen. Learn to address the issue. That's why I want all parents here to attend our apologetics class. We have developed apologetics classes to equip parents, to equip you, to learn to address issues. Why is there pain? Why is there suffering? Why will Jesus allow my loved ones to die? How do you know he died and rose again? All of these are legitimate questions. And if you are not able to answer them properly, don't be surprised when in time of crisis, your children will leave the faith and you will leave the faith. So let's welcome our brother Paul. Paul, come here. We want to welcome you. Give us your story. What happened to you? Uh, good afternoon, everyone. I am honored to stand before you today and share my testimony of how God guided me from a life of skepticism to a profound and unwavering faith in the gospel of Jesus. My upbringing was deeply rooted in a nurturing Christian home. From my early days in kindergarten through the completion of my elementary education, the teachings of Christianity enveloped me. Each Sunday, my family and I attended church, and during those formative years, the stories of the Bible served as more than mere narratives. They were the very foundation of my understanding, shaping the lens through which I perceived the world. However, everything shifted when I entered a secular high school. Here, I encountered a diverse array of perspectives, beliefs, 
and philosophical approaches that challenged the foundation of my faith. This environment prompted me to question not only the beliefs of those around me, but also the convictions that I had held since childhood. Seeds of doubt took root, leading me to grapple with the fundamental questions about the validity of my faith. I then realized that the only reason why I claimed to believe in Jesus was because I was just told by my parents, friends, and churchmates that I should believe in Him, and not because I have honestly studied the evidence or the proof of what I believe in. I asked many different theological questions like, if God is real and the Bible says that He is loving, then why is there suffering and evil in the world? If He is powerful enough to instantly remove all forms of pain and wickedness, then why doesn't He? Or, how can I believe in a person rising from the dead? Hasn't science already ruled that out from ever happening? I listened and considered the answers of my mentors, but due to my per mental and emotional frailties back then, I deemed their responses to be lacking or an unsatisfactory. Determined to maintain an open mind, I resolved not to, not to affirm any doctrinal assertions blindly. Instead, I embraced a mindset that probed every truth claim I encountered. And living as a skeptic, my focus shifted to societal welfare, studying diligently, securing a good job, and striving to do more good than harm. It was a period of personal freedom where the absence of consciously thinking of final judgment after death allowed me to explore life without constraints. It didn't take a long time for me to see that this was unsustainable and destructive. I ended up becoming extremely confused regarding my definitions of what was right and wrong and what my purpose was for living. I had fallen into sin, which led me to make decisions that resulted in so much pain in the lives of my friends and family. Even if I was already working and making a decent amount of money at the time, I still felt hopeless, lost, and desperate for answers. I realized that not even success, wealth, hobbies, relationships, or fame could satisfy the innermost longings of my heart. So, when the pandemic struck back in 2020, I finally had an opportunity to settle once and for all if Christianity was actually true or not. I decided to take my spiritual journey seriously, so I resigned from my job just so that I could focus entirely on studying apologetics and theology from the world's top teachers and resources on the internet. I enrolled in online courses and spent almost 15 hours a day, every day, for one whole year, researching on the historicity of the resurrection, the origins of the Bible, the prophecies that Jesus came to fulfill, systematic theology, eschatology, and many other topics. I read the New Testament over six times, read the Torah three times, finished books of various theologians, and listened to hundreds of hours of podcasts from Bible scholars. After intensely wrestling with the Word, praying to God that He reveal Himself to me, and crying out to Him for forgiveness and clarity, I came to the conclusion and could definitively say that Jesus truly is the Messiah prophesied in the Hebrew Scriptures. Yes. Yes, thank you. And that He came to die for our sins and my sin and rose again from the dead and now offers forgiveness and eternal life for those who will believe in His name. After that, I realized that if the Bible and this Jesus I have been studying about is actually real, then I can't stay silent about Him. I can't be passive and just let my friends and family perish without knowing about His gospel. So, I approached close friends and asked if they could help me start online Bible studies 
so that we could share the gospel with anyone we could invite. This led to three weekly Bible studies throughout the latter half of the pandemic, where we went through and finished the book of Galatians, Ephesians, and Philippians, explaining the doctrines found in each chapter, examining it verse by verse. I also started three weekly discipleship groups to intentionally lead my friends and relatives in their walk of faith. I also had the opportunity to give talks at some CCF satellites about apologetics and theology, answering the very same issues and contentions that I had that now other college students and young adults have. And just last year, God placed in my heart to enroll in a seminary in order to hone my knowledge and my skills even further. It is here where I'm currently being trained, not just theologically, but God has also been working to mold my character to love Him and others even more, developing a heart of servant steward leadership. I am Paul Gideon Homento, once a lost skeptic, but now I am found, and here in the truth of Christ I will eternally stand. To Jesus be all the glory, both now and forever. Amen. Praise God. Well, this morning your discipler was here. I think he's now hungry and he left you, but no problem. Ladies and gentlemen, I'd like you to know something about our brother here. You know, Paul is still single. He's, he's still young, but um, he'll be graduating soon from one of the best seminary in the world. Jim, do you agree with that, Jim Olcha? Yeah, Jim and I are a product of that school also. And uh, I'd like us to pray for him. And all of you, if you have questions about the Bible, what should you believe, contact him. Is that okay with you? So I'm giving you a new job description now to be available to the whole church worldwide. Is that okay with you? Okay, everybody, let's raise your hands. Let's pray for our brother. Lord Jesus, I thank you for Paul. I thank you for all that you've done in his life, how you have changed the direction of his life from pride, from sin, all kinds of rationalization to a life surrendered to who you are, the Son of God, the one who died and rose again. And I pray you protect him as he goes through seminary and that you continue to use him and above all, expand his borders. I thank you for his parents, how they've supported him, and now I pray for his ministry. Guide him, protect him, and enlarge his border. In Jesus' name we all pray. Amen and amen. God bless you, brother. You know, what happened to him is a warning to all of us. What do I mean? In James chapter 2, the Bible tells us, you believe that God is one, yet you do well. The demons also believe. In other words, everybody, point your forefinger in the head, okay? Just because you believe in the head does not mean much. The devil believes, but the devil is not gonna be transformed. What is lacking? From the head to the heart. And then from the heart to, the, to your life. Now, let me read to you another verse that I hope will tell you why you and I should be careful in discipling people. The Bible says, they went out from us but they were not really of us. If they had been of us, they would, not, they would have remained with us, but they went out so that it would be shown that they are not of us. See, don't be shocked, don't be surprised. If you see some Christians who are worshiping God now, but eventually they fall off. The Bible warns us. Who is a real Christian? Everybody, what do you do with the gospel? Everybody? No. Who Jesus is? No. Then what must you do? Believe. And then you live. Now that believing part is so crucial because the Bible warns us again and again in Matthew chapter 24. I want you to tell your young children, young disciples, this verse because lawlessness is increased. Most people's love will grow cold. 
but the one who endures to the end, he will be saved. The Bible tells us the doctrine of the perseverance of the saints. If you are a real Christian, you may fall into sin, but you will not stay in sin because the grace of God will somehow bring you back. The perseverance of the saints. That is what the Bible says. However, be careful right now because lawlessness is now all over the place. If you are not careful, you will allow your lifestyle to dictate your theology. Let me repeat. Somebody will reject Jesus for many reasons. One is outright ignorance. Another one is because of pride. But another one is because of their lifestyle. You don't want to give up sin. You don't want to give your lifestyle. You don't want to give that up. You need to rationalize your behavior. And the only way to rationalize your behavior is get rid of your faith. And that's why many people, the Bible tells us, because of lawlessness, people's halab will grow cold. But the one who endures to the end, my friend, I am praying that all of us will endure to the end. No wonder in 1 Corinthians chapter 10, verse 5 and 8, to let you know why you believe what you believe. Why? Let's read this together. He appeared to Cephas, then to the twelve. After that, he appeared to more than 500 brethren at one time, most of whom remain until now. Some have fallen asleep. He appeared to James, then to all the apostles, and last of all, as to one untimely born, he appeared to me also. The Bible is not a legend. These are historical documents. The emphasis of the Apostle Paul, he gave three names about the appearance of Jesus. The first name he gave was Cephas. I will tell you why in a short while. The second name he gave was James. I'll tell you why later on. This is the brother of Jesus. He never believed in Jesus. John chapter 7. The Bible says they did not believe in Jesus. The brothers of Jesus did not believe. My friend, let's, let's face it. If you and I are the brothers of Jesus and we were playing Jolene with him, we were playing hide and seek with him, and then suddenly he appears and tells us, I am the way the truth and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. Will you believe? That's why they make fun of him. They say, you just show up in Jerusalem. Then your disciples will believe you. They did not believe him. What changed their mind? The resurrection. Jesus purposely appeared to James. James is the half-brother of Jesus who wrote the book of James. And then he appeared to who? To Paul. Why? This is what I'd like you to understand now. To believe is one thing. To believe in the heart is another thing. For the Apostle Paul, from the head to the heart, and you know why it affected his lifestyle? Because he was so convinced. My friend, I don't know about you, what you believe in Jesus about. But can I tell you, later on remind me to tell you why he talked to, why the name Cephas, Peter, appeared, why the name James appeared, why the name Paul, why was specific, he was there mentioned. But remember, he appeared to how many people? More than 500. Hallucination cannot happen with 500 people at the same time. If all of us see something, it must be true. You cannot say all of us are hallucinating at the same time. The evidence for Jesus is so overwhelming. Do you know the first message of the Apostle Peter? Can you guess? Tell me the first message ever uttered by the Apostle Peter, by the Apostle James, by the Apostle Paul. 
by the Apostle John. What were their first messages recorded in the Bible? Do you know? If this is the most important, the gospel, Jesus died and rose again from the dead, if that is the most important message because it affects your salvation, can you guess what is their first message recorded in the book of Acts? Guess. You don't have to be smart to guess. I'm giving you all the hints. Let's look. The first gospel message preached, God raised him up again. It's all about the resurrection. The Prince of Life, whom God raised from the dead. Acts chapter 4, in Jesus, the resurrection of the dead. Notice, he talks about God of our fathers raised up Jesus. These are all first messages, and their emphasis is this. We are witnesses. We are witnesses. In short, what was their first message, everybody? Jesus died for our sins, buried, and he rose again. Why is the resurrection important? Because the resurrection proves that Jesus is more than just a man, more than just a teacher. He is the Messiah. Ah, that's important. So how did all of these preachers die? You know how they died, the apostles and the leaders? Let me show you how they died. James. Now this is the apostle. He was early beheaded in Jerusalem. This is not James the brother, it's the apostle. Nathaniel Bartholomew, crucified. Matthew, killed by a sword, Ethiopia. Andrew, crucified, X-shaped cross. Thomas, martyred in India. And that's why Jim is going to go to India. Jim, I hope you will see some Thomasites in the southern part of India. You have believers today who call themselves Thomasites because of the influence of the apostle Thomas. Philip, crucified in Turkey. Peter, crucified upside down. Jude, crucified. James, this is the other apostle, James, beaten, stoned, hit in the head. Simon, the zealot, crucified in England. Matthias, the one who replaced Jude, Judas, remember? Crucified in Georgia. James, the brother of Jesus, is stoned to death by the Pharisees in Jerusalem. James, the brother of Jesus, refused to run away from Jerusalem. He became the leader of the churches in Jerusalem. But he was martyred. And last of all, of course, Paul. You know why Paul was beheaded, not crucified? Because Paul was a Roman citizen. A Roman citizen is not allowed by law to be crucified. Crucifixion is so cruel that Romans are not allowed. Slow, sure death. Sometimes it will take three days, four days, before a crucified person will die. Amazing torture. Why will they all suffer for something that is not true? Why will you preach? Why will you write about the resurrection? Preach about the resurrection knowing that you will be crucified. Why will you do that? Unless, unless what? It is true. Nobody will die for something knowing it is false. You may die for something because you thought it was true, but you will never die for something knowing it is not true. And you know, one of my favorite lawyers, if you have been to CCF, you will know whom I'm talking to, Simon Greenleaf. Simon Greenleaf is the lawyer that made Harvard Law School famous. This guy was an atheist. He did not believe in Jesus, but he was challenged by young people, like some of you. Professor, why don't you just prove to us that Jesus did not rise again from the dead? He took the challenge. I will do it, and I'll prove to you this is a legend. Do you want to know his conclusion? 
This is his conclusion. The resurrection is one of the best documented events in the history of man. You need to understand science and the Bible don't conflict. The only difference is the scientific method is something you can repeat. But the legal method is something else. How can I prove to you I was in Indonesia? How can I prove to you? Last week. How can I prove to you I spoke to many, many, many people in Indonesia? How? I cannot do scientific method. I can repeat. However, I, I witnesses. Yes or no? I witness. I have documentation. In other words, the Bible is not anti-intellectual. The only problem is we are lazy and we believe in what the people are saying that you cannot trust the Bible. No, no. Another favorite lawyer of mine, his name is Sir Leonel Lokho. Lokho is the most successful lawyer according to the Guinness Book of Record. 245 murder acquittals. My goodness, this is your accused of murder. He was able to acquit 245. Is that a good lawyer? Knighted by Queen Elizabeth two times. So this guy is respected. He was not a Christian. He was challenged. Why don't you use your brilliant mind and prove that Jesus did not rise again from the dead? Can I tell you why? You cannot disprove Jesus. Historically, he's a historical person. He lived. The only thing you challenge is this. Did he rise again from the dead? Do you want to know his conclusion? All right. This is his conclusion. Everybody read. I say unequivocally that the evidence for the resurrection of Jesus Christ is so overwhelming. It compels acceptance by proof, which leaves absolutely no room for doubt. Let's talk about a younger lawyer by the name of Lee Strobel. How many of you have heard of Lee Strobel? Ah, you are young. Lee Strobel is the famous investigator of the Chicago Tribune newspaper. He was the one who exposed the Ford Pinto gas tank that if you hit it, it explodes. This guy is so good in investigation, but he was an atheist. He does not like Christians, except there's a problem. His wife became a Christian. When the wife became a Christian, he was thinking, how in the world can I allow my wife to believe all of these foolish things about Christianity? But you know what bothered him? The wife changed. What bothered him was the wife became a good wife. And I realized it's hard to fight somebody whose character is Christ-like. So he said, I will save my wife. I'm going to study. I will join. I will study and prove to her Christianity is nonsense. Would you like to know his conclusion? Remember, all of you, if your children question it, don't be angry. You must be able to entertain inquisitive mind because Christianity is open for investigation. Nobody will cancel you. Unlike other religions, they'll cancel you, they'll kill you. In Christianity, you can question it and nobody will kill you. We will be happy to help you find the truth. This is his conclusion. Everybody read. The resurrection is the supreme vindication of Jesus' divine identity and his inspired teaching. It is the proof of his triumph over sin and death. It is the basis of Christian hope. It's the miracle of all miracles. It is the foreshadowing of the resurrection of his followers. My friend, next week, I will personally share with you part two of 1 Corinthians chapter 15. If you think today is exciting, you ain't hear anything yet. Are you ready for next week? Okay. Invite your friends 
who are questioning the Bible, who don't know the Bible, invite them here next week. Is that okay with you? The reason why I did not tell so much the first service, because second service, we still have rooms. Yes? So what will you do with those empty chairs? Invite your friends. Amen? One more time. Will you invite your friends? All right. After that, give them free lunch. And they will come. All right. Let me share with you what does it mean to live it out. Okay? Okay. Let's review. What do you do with the gospel to make your life really count? Everybody? No. Everybody? No. Yes. And then what do you do? Believe. And what do you do? You live it. How do you live it? I want to show you. Remember those three, peop those three persons? Paul, James, Peter. Let's look. Let's look at the Apostle Paul. I am the least of the apostles. I am not fit to be called an apostle because I persecuted the church of God. But by the grace of God, I am what I am. And his grace toward me did not prove vain, but I labored even more than all of them. Yet not I, but the grace of God with me, whether I then, it was I or they, we preach and you believe. Ladies and gentlemen, will you invite the Apostle Paul to become a pastor of CCF? Yes or no? You know, reality, you will not. That was the experience of Paul. When he first came to Christ, the disciples will not want to associate with him. Let me tell you why. Because he was a persecutor. He killed Christians. He sent them to jail. Imagine your loved ones were part of the victims of the Apostle Paul. Will you ever want Paul to be the senior pastor? Probably you will say, uh-uh, I don't trust this guy. The Bible says they did not trust him. They don't want to associate with him until Barnabas guided him. Do you know it took Paul more than 13 years, 12 to 15 years, to gain the trust of the early church? But Paul experienced the grace of God. I want you to know something. If you know the grace of God, you know of one truth. Your sins have been forgiven. For the Apostle Paul, Paul knew. All my sins have been what? Forgiven. Paul understood the grace of God. Many of us are not gracious to people. We are judgmental. We are harsh on people. But once you understand the gospel, you begin to understand we are a product of God's grace. What is grace? Grace simply means what? Undeserved favor. Grace means what? You don't deserve it. God gives it to us. Paul does not deserve grace. He does not deserve forgiveness. But God gave him forgiveness. So when you experience the gospel, your past is settled. Your present and your future is assured. That's, that is Paul. What about Peter? Let me ask you a question. Will you want Peter to be the pastor of CCF? Yes or no? Can I tell you something? Of course, all of you are very gracious. You will not mind Peter, but can I tell you? I can imagine in a particular church where the leaders are meeting together. Are we going to hire Peter? Are we going to get him to be our pastor? You know why most leaders will say no? You know why? Because when Peter was being trained by Jesus, at the last year of the last week of the life of Jesus, after Peter has been discipled for the longest time, what did Peter do? He denied Jesus. How many times? You know how he denied him? The first time it was a young girl. The girl said, ah, you are with Jesus. What did Peter say? <coughs> Sorry, I don't know who is this man. And then another girl. Girls. Peter is afraid of girls. Girl said, ah, you are with Jesus. What did Peter say? In Tagalog. No comprende. I don't know who is Jesus. 
The third time, confronted again. The Bible tells us Peter curse, shouting, I don't know him, I don't know him. Now, between us, do you want somebody who has been trained by Jesus? Upon graduation time, he denied the master. Will you want him to be a pastor? You see what I'm saying? Friend, the gospel is so amazing. It gives all of us a new beginning. Some of us have known Jesus, but you've turned away and you think you are finished. No, you are never finished. The gospel gives you every day a new opportunity to walk and serve Jesus. And that, my friend, is why once you know the gospel, it goes to your heart, it transforms your life. Grace will transform. Grace will never tolerate sin. It is impossible. You will change. Of course, you know James, right? James was transformed. Therefore, I want you to read the ending of 1 Corinthians 15, part 1. Look at the power of the gospel from the head to the heart. You know why it will impact your heart and your action? If Christ is preached that he has been raised from the dead, how do some among you say there is no resurrection of the dead? He's now talking about the implications of the resurrection. If there is no resurrection of the dead, not even Christ has been raised. If Christ has not been raised, our preaching is vain. Your faith is vain. He's saying if the resurrection is not true, everything here is a joke. Read the next verse. <clears throat> Moreover, we are even found to be false witnesses of God because we testified against God that he raised Christ, whom he did not raise, if in fact the dead are not raised. For if, Christ, if the dead are not raised, not even Christ has been raised. And if Christ has not been raised, your faith is worthless. You are still in your sin. Continue. The Bible tells us, then those who have, been, those who have fallen asleep in Christ have perished. If we have hope in Christ in this life only, we are of all men most to be pitied. In simple English, it is called the argument of logic. If this happened, then. If this did not happen, then. What is he saying? If Jesus did not rise again from the dead, then everything we are doing here is totally useless because everything is false. But Christ rose again from the dead. And because Christ rose again from the dead, then everything I'm telling you is true. Your future is assured. Implications is staggering. I like what C.S. Lewis said. If Christianity is true, let's read that quotation, if you don't mind. According to C.S. Lewis, Christianity, if false, everybody read, is of no importance. If true, of infinite importance. The only thing it cannot be is moderately important. My concern is many of you here are not taking Christianity seriously. You come here, praise God, maybe out of duty, or you want to please your family, but you are not taking Christ seriously. Friend, I want you to imagine you are joining me on a time machine. Okay, can you imagine? Have you seen the movie, this time, uh, what's the name of that movie? where you're a time machine, you can go backward, you can go forward. Back to the future. Okay. I have a better machine, okay? Now imagine, I can invite you. Come with me. I want you to imagine now. You ride with me. I will bring you to the future. I want you to look at your life, how your life will end, and then I want you to look forward to eternity. Now you are now at the end of time. That's eternity. That machine will bring you there. You begin to see what you had never imagined. Now this is what you saw. Example, if you are the Apostle Peter, 
This is what you will see in the future. The Apostle Peter saw the following. 1st, 2nd Peter chapter 3, verse 10. The day of the Lord will come like a thief in which the heavens will pass away with a roar and the elements will be destroyed with intense heat. The earth and its works will be burned up. Peter is describing the end of times. He's describing a nuclear war. In that nuclear war, the Bible tells us, look at what's going to happen. The elements will be destroyed with intense heat. Did you know the word for the elements is where you have the word atom, the smallest particle? Intense heat. Description of nuclear fusion. Read the next verse. Since all of these things are to be destroyed, what sort of people you ought to be in holy conduct, godliness, looking and hastening the coming of the day of God, because of which the heavens will be destroyed by burning, and the elements, the atoms, will melt with intense heat. You know what Peter is saying? If you know everything is going to be burned up, your houses, your real estate, all your properties, all your paintings, all your riches. Peter is saying, think about it. What life, what kind of life should you live? Now, the Apostle Paul saw something also in the future. You know what the Apostle Paul saw? So that at the name of Jesus, every knee will bow, those who are in heaven and on earth and under the earth, Every tongue will confess Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. The Apostle Paul saw one day when Jesus comes again, the Bible tells us every knee will bow, every tongue will confess that Jesus is Lord. Someday there is only going to be one king, the king of kings. There is only going to be one kingdom, the kingdom of God. And everybody else will submit to the Lordship of Jesus. And that, my friend, is the meaning of the word judgment day. Now, my friend, if you believe these things, and now I bring you back, will it affect the way you live? If you really believe with all your heart, someday you know the end game. You know who's going to win the war. You know I know the end game. You better choose the right side. Do you know people used to say, choose the right side of history? I know history. History has been written. Every knee will bow. Every tongue will confess. Jesus is Lord. Amen? Now, which side are you on? Let me close with a story which my pastor shared with me years ago. He came from a communist country. He said, in that country, people were baptized midnight so that the secret police will not catch them. Well, this particular night, the secret police were waiting for them. So before they were baptized, the secret police, the policemen came and lined them up beside the sea and say, we will give you a chance. Deny Jesus and we let you live. What will you do if you are one of those? There were 10 men to be baptized, one by one. Deny Jesus, we let you live. If not, we shoot you. What will you do? According to him, there was a person who decided, I will deny Jesus. And when he said he will deny Jesus, the communist said, okay, get out of the line. And then another soldier told the commander, can I take his place? I want to take his place. And the commander said, are you crazy? Why will you take his place? And then the soldier said, when they were lining up, I saw the heaven open. I saw 10 crowns. The crowns were being brought down. 
to, to these people. And since this man does not want the crown, I will take his place. Friends, when your perspective is changed, your behavior will change. I don't want to live for the temporal. I live for eternity. My friend, that is why the gospel message is crucial. You got to know, you got to believe, and you have to live it. If you don't know why you believe what you believe, I am afraid you will not endure. Paul is saying, don't feel sorry for us. Can I share you with you that verse? Okay, let's close. This is what the Apostle Paul said. Before this verse, Paul says, if the resurrection is not true, you know what Paul says? If the dead are not raised, let us what? Eat, drink, for tomorrow we die. But he said, ah, the dead are raised. There is eternal life. So he closed with this. Everybody read. Therefore, my beloved brethren, be steadfast, immovable, always abounding in the work of the Lord, knowing that your toil is not in vain. My friend, you keep serving God. You keep being faithful to God because your toil is not in vain. The choice is yours today. To live for Jesus or to live for yourself. But he tells me, Therefore, I will expand next Sunday. My beloved brethren, what must you do? Together, steadfast, immovable, always abounding in the work of the Lord. Guys, don't feel sorry for pastors. Don't feel sorry for workers. Don't feel sorry for missionaries. Don't feel sorry for your D group leaders. You know why? Because we are doing something we know is worthwhile. It's worth it. I don't want to invest my life on something that is worthless. Would you like your life to count? Everybody, know the gospel. Say that with me. Know the gospel. Believe in the heart and live it. Let's bow our heads and pray. If God has been speaking to you, and today you finally understand. You understood for the first time what it means to be a real Christian. And you want to declare Jesus as your Lord and Savior. Will you raise your hands? Higher. Praise God. Praise God. Many of you. Higher, higher. I want you to make a real honest to goodness prayer. You will not waste time playing religion. You will not waste time trying to live like a Christian, but you are not a real Christian. I want you to live out your faith with a sincere heart. And that's your commitment. You will take Jesus seriously. I want to pray for you. Praise God for many of you. All right? Those of you who raised their hands, I want you to make this prayer meaningful. Kindly stand up. Yes, stand up and pray. Pray with me. Those of you who raised their hands, today, you want to make a public declaration of your faith in Jesus between you and Jesus. Forget other people. It does not matter what they say, what they think. It's important is you. You and Jesus and Jesus alone. God looks at your heart. And you want to say, Lord, I will declare you as my Lord and Savior. Anybody else? I know some of you are fighting in your heart. You are fighting in your seat. Well, I want you to surrender to Jesus. You know why? He is the Son of God. He is the coming King. Praise God. Anybody else? Okay. With your hands raised up, let's pray. And you pray with me. Those of you who are standing up, those of you who are seated, if you want to pray, you can pray with me also. Lord Jesus, here I am. I confess to you I'm a sinner. I confess to you I have never taken you seriously. Today, I recognize you as the Messiah, the only one, the Son of God, who died and rose again from the dead. 
Thank you for the forgiveness of my sins. I accept the grace of eternal life. I accept the grace of being able to serve you. Change my heart today. Make it a new day. For the rest of my life, I ask for grace. I ask for strength. In Jesus' name we all pray. Amen and amen. God bless you. Good day, CCF family. Welcome to Sunday Fast Track, where you ask real life questions and we give you biblical truths. I am Sigurd de la Paz from the Elevate Ministry, and we're here today with our speaker, Pastor Peter Tanchi, to answer some of your questions. Good day, Pastor Peter. How are you? I am fine. You? Great too. Great, Thank great, you. Great. So for your first question, according to C.S. Lewis, Christianity is either of no importance or infinite importance. It cannot be moderately important. Pastor Peter, how do we win those who are leaning towards seeing Christianity being of no importance? The reason why people feel it is not important mm -hmm. because they don't really understand the gospel. You see, what you think what you know affects your emotions. Mm -hmm. So if you don't understand really the full implications of who Jesus is, why he came, what's going to happen to us someday, why would you take it seriously? You will just think it's another religion. Mm -hmm. That's why the way you think is absolutely important. Mm -hmm. And if you don't take Christianity seriously, that means you don't understand who is Jesus. Mm -hmm. You don't understand what he will do again someday. He's going to return, not to be the savior, but to be the judge and the king. Mm -hmm. I take that seriously. Mm -hmm. That's really amazing and great learning. For a second question, we learn in today's message that the resurrection helps Christians live with an eternal mindset. However, many Christians today are also faced with distractions or maybe even problems that cause a shift in mindset. Pastor, how do we balance our priorities here on earth while still living with eternity in mind? That is why the Bible tells us you must learn to meditate. Mm. Distractions, problems are sure to come. And Satan would always like to sidetrack us. So how do I maintain my balance? I have to practice the discipline of right thinking. That's why I practice the discipline of prayer, mm. the discipline of studying the Bible. It is when I'm alone and I discipline myself and I think through life. See, many times we don't think through. Mm -hmm. We don't think what is our goals, what are our priorities, because we are so busy with activities. Mm -hmm. And that's why I believe you need to practice the discipline of silence, the discipline of meditation, and the discipline of worship. Do you notice when you come on Sunday, your mind is recalibrated? Mm -hmm. When you worship with people, that is what you call practical spiritual discipline. Yes. Thank you, Pastor. Really pausing and being with the God-given community. And for a third and last question, what is your advice to people whose lifestyle is highly influenced by social media and are fully aware that their lives go against biblical teachings, yet deliberately chooses to enjoy the leanings and desires of their hearts because it is what makes them happy? This is where I like to tell all believers mm. to practice Loving people as they are. In other words, your love for them is not conditioned that they will listen to you. However, to love people also means you need to be firm. Mm -hmm. You need to balance truth and love. So I will explain to them the truth, but I have discovered something. You will not know the truth if God's grace is not poured out upon these people. They need to experience the grace of God. People who are happy now think they will continuously be happy. Mm -hmm. The truth is no. They will hit a wall and then they'll probably begin to think of you and they will call you. But right now they think everything's okay. That is the fallacy of walking with your own wisdom and not following God. You can be happy, but it's called temporal happiness. You can be okay, but it's temporal okay because there is such a thing as truth you violate truth you will be the one to suffer it is not truth cannot be changed i mean truth is truth mm -hmm. it's like the law of gravity 
You can violate the law of gravity. You don't break the law of gravity. You cannot break the law of gravity. It will break you. The same thing with issue of gender, issue of right or wrong. That, that is a real problem today. They think it's okay, but they don't realize the heart of God. God is saying, that's not how I design you. But you can only do that when you have a relationship. Why would they listen to you if you keep lecturing them? Mm. Ah. That's right. Truly, long and true happiness is only found in Jesus alone. Thank you so much, Pastor Peter, for answering those questions. But before we go, IDC, or Intentional Discipleship Conference, is coming this January 25 to 27, 2024. And we have exciting plenary speakers and workshops in store for you. So get your tickets now. You can purchase your tickets at the ground floor lobby here at the CCF Center or via idc.org. And that's it for our CCF Sunday Fast Track. God bless you guys. God bless.